We are united. We will do it in the right time. We have done it before. 92, 96, 2000, 2008, we did it. So it's not an issue at all. At the appropriate time, the President's candidate will meet the National Council. We shall have a discussion. I will name the running mate. And so far as I'm concerned, there is no contest. Breaking the right is a movement. It's a movement. It's fucking up. Furtherance of our digitalization agenda in the education sector, government is proceeding with plans to distribute 1.3 million educational tablets to students in senior high schools. That is one student per tablet under the Ghana Smart Schools project. The tablets are fitted with digital contents to aid research, teaching, and learning. At the tertiary level, government plans to provide, at a discounted price, tablets and laptops to students and lecturers to facilitate academic work. <laughs> Though largely successful, government continues to seek innovative ways to boost further the free SHS policy. Government is convinced that the next phase of free SHS enhancement will be propelled by digitalization. This will allow a seamless online and offline teaching and learning experience. Indeed, the enhanced free SHS school will be environmentally friendly, boost academic performance, fitted with interactive displays, interactive learning, and increased productivity, which is what has given birth to the Ghana Smart Schools project. The project seeks to deepen the application of IT in teaching and learning at the second cycle level. It will ultimately enhance the performance of students and prepare them better for higher learning and the competitive careers in future. The other component of the Ghana Smart School project is the provision of modernized infrastructure. Government intends to build 100 smart schools across the country. The first 30 of these will be completed this year, and the remaining 70 expected to be completed in the next two years. And for the avoidance of doubt, it is planned that the 100 smart schools will be located in the following cities and towns in all 80, 16 regions. Eastern region, Kuforidia, Akropong, Chebi, and Abetifi, Greater Accra region, Atimota, Ajingano, Amasamai, and Medina. Volta region, Ho, Oti region, Dambai, Ahafu region, Mem, Blanc East region, Techiman and Nkuranza, Northeast region, Nalerigo, Western North region, Enchi, Central region, Salpong and Kasua. Western region, Takrade, Takwa, and Wasa Ekropol. Bono region, Sunyane, Fiapre. Ashanti region, Tepa, Jabing, Mampo, and Kumase, Bantama. Upper East region, Bogatanga, and Binduli. Upper West region, Wa. Northern region, Karaga, Tamale, and Yendi. And Savannah region, Damango. These smart school buildings will be fitted with solar panels as we seek to promote new and environmentally sustainable energy. In effect, these smart schools will be off the national electricity grid. They will also have they will also have digitalized infrastructure advanced teaching and learning. 
Physical infrastructure takes cognizance of our unique climatic conditions and will create a condis conducive atmosphere for learning. The schools will represent a new urban landmark for urban and rural land use and planning. There will be modern, iconic facilities depicting the collective resolve of a people for transformative and futuristic education. The just ended games were a monumental disaster and total embarrassment to our dear country. The Akufuado Baumia NPP government spent a staggering $240 million on the just ended games. Yet, the organization and management of the event was poor and shambolic. Quite apart from the fact that it lacked clear combined effect of economic viability, the organization of the games lacked clear cut policies for tourism, promotion, and trade facilitation. We also approved 100 million Ghana cities for goods and services for the LOC for operation this year, and then 50 million Ghana cities for CAPEX for operation this year. So in total, 150 million Ghana cities. And if you work that in dollars, it comes to roughly about $12 million. Now, the LOC is spending $48 million from the extra money. You have spent so much money and you have failed to deliver on what we all wish. How many will not be happy to see our athletes compete in this year's Olympic that is, go that is going to be held in uh, Paris this year. And you will see the number of uh, cameras and viewers across the world who usually patronize us uh, the Olympics. And if we really understand the economics of it, uh, if, we, if we appreciate why we have to send at least to such events, uh, the, the economics of it, now we've lost out. And so you realize that why do you bask in any happiness uh, after spending so much money and you fail to deliver uh, what the country wants? We, the NDC Minority Caucus, call for a bipartisan parliamentary probe into the budget and expenditure for the preparation and organization of the Games. Ghanaians deserve leadership who uphold dignity and focus on meaningful progress for the nation. As representatives of the people and advocates for gender equality, it is imperative that we stand united in denouncing such reprehensible behavior and demand strict accountability from those who perpetrate it. We call upon Chairman Woon to me and all other individuals who engage in such deplorable conduct to publicly apologize to Professor Nana Jane Opokwa Jimai and refrain from making any further derogatory comments. We are giving Chairman Woon to me seven days ultimatum to publicly retract and apologize to Professor Nana Jane Opokwa Jimai and extend the same apology to all women in Ghana, or we will advise ourselves. Uh, what is the current status? What is the current status? Uh, 80, as we said, because of uh, them uh, having a leg into Nigeria using a different cable provider that was not affected. You know, they always remain 100%. Uh, and then on March 19th, which I believe will be what, Tuesday, uh, Telesel reported that they were 100% uh, capacity. They have 100% capacity. Uh, MTN recovered 100% uh, capacity for peak. You know, again, each MNO have peak, peak uh, traffic requirement. 
So if, uh, if you have, uh, if your peak is, let's just say for the purpose of the discussion, your peak is uh, 80 gig, right? And whenever you have 80, you know that you can service what? All your customers. And, and that's what MTN report. And this MTN has 80. I'm just using it as an example. Uh, so, so currently as we speak, uh, 80, 100%, uh, Telesa 100%, uh, MTN 100%. So the question is, um, if, if they are 100%, does it mean the cables are up? No, I told you, you know, all the four cables are down, uh, but currently uh, the, the MNOs and the cable providers are leveraging uh, cable providers that are in the West Coast that were not impacted uh, by the outage. So that's what is happening. Again, so I, we explained that all the aforementioned traffic, 80, 100%, Telesa, 100%, MTN, 100% of the peak traffic, they are all riding on cables in, in the sub-region that were not impacted. Uh, why is it important to know? Many of you have complained that uh, if you say everything is up, why do we uh, have this intermittent uh, slowness of services? Well, think about it. If you want to go to London, you can buy a, 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 a ticket BA. Buy BA, Accra, London, six hours, you are there. But you can also decide to buy, to, to, to take Africa World to maybe Lagos, and then from there take um, Kenya Airways to South Africa, and then take, take BA again to London. You still get to London, but it will be slow. So that's what is happening. Because all our cables are down, they are having to leverage on cables that are not currently right. So you will have to, for example, you will have to, um, there's a cable that has been provisioned by one of the very hard working um, local Ghanaian companies uh, called C Square. They managed to bring good, good traffic to the MNOs from, from Lomi. So it means that you have to find a way to bring that traffic to where? To Accra and then be able to now distribute it to the MNOs. Right. So if you are going to, so if you are going to the internet, rather than jumping to your cable provider directly, now you go to your MNO who now goes through the local terrestrial fiber to Lomi, right? And then you jump on a cable that might be going to South Africa before it goes to, before it goes to um, uh, Europe or goes to Nigeria before it goes. The campaign Protect the Protest aims to raise awareness about the importance of protecting the right to protest in Ghana while aiming to defend the fundamental right to protest and ensure that all voices in the country are heard loud and clear. Country Director of Amnesty International Ghana, Genevieve Patenton, spoke on behalf of the organization reaffirming their commitment to defending human rights in Ghana. Protests in Africa were for independence. Now, contemporary protests in Africa are influenced by high cost of living, participatory governance, erratic power supply, unemployment, poor road infrastructure, and corruption. It is a fact, and statistics show, that in most cases, protests do bring about positive change. Unfortunately, protests all over the world, including democratic states like Ghana, have never been more under at attack than they are today. Our quest to campaign for the rights of protesters, which is anchored in the provisions of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 20, and Article 21 of our 1992 Constitution, seeks to make sure that people in Ghana and beyond take part in peaceful protests and have their voice heard safely without any form of repercussions. Our Protect the Protest campaign plans to engage and empower all of these stakeholders so nobody is left behind. This year being election year for Ghana, we envisage several protests being held and the need for all stakers to be prepared in that regard. As a forward-thinking democracy, Ghana has established in our constitution that citizens of Ghana have the right to peaceful assembly, 
Yes, sometimes authorities may try to suppress peaceful protests through various means such as excessive force, arrests, and intimidation. But Amnesty International Ghana will ensure legal advocacy as a tool for protesters to know their rights and to challenge any unlawful actions by authorities. Speaking on behalf of President Nana Adudan Kwakofu Ado, Deputy Attorney General and Minister of Justice Diana Asunabadapa expressed the president's support for the campaign, stating that the government is committed to upholding the fundamental human rights of all citizens, including the right to protest. A very warm greetings from the president of the Republic of Ghana, Nana Dodanko Kufuad. Indeed, the president desires that I speak from my heart because as issues of protest are concerned, people protest out of their heart. And I also found that he attaches very great importance to this particular dialogue and to Amnesty International Ghana because I indicated to the board chair that when he couldn't make it, he called me at midnight to make sure I stepped into his shoes and to give you all the support that is required. Now, speaking from the heart, I believe that it is trite. I tend to say that I do not think anybody is ignorant of the fact that the right to protest is a fundamental human right. In fact, it is a culmination of a number of rights, particularly the right, I mean, free speech, um, freedom of assembly, and usually is hinged on the fact that a number of rights have also been violated. Again, as the board chair rightly indicated, our president is a pioneer, one of the pioneers, arguably, of the right to protest. And the records are there to indicate. Again, as the office of the attorney general, we are also mandated by our office and by law as legal practitioners to uphold all the tenets of fundamental human rights, a profession in which our president is also part of. And so today we're very excited to be here. I believe that Article 21 of our constitution is right, recognizing this right to protest, freedom of assembly, free speech. Of course, what I believe is outstanding between protesters government and any other stakeholder is to appreciate a healthy balance between the nuances of the right to protest and the need to protect public health safety as established by the constitution on that note let me congratulate amnesty international ghana for this invitation to the president he requires that i let you know that you have his full support and of course, you have the support of the Office of the Attorney General as well. The launch event was attended by human rights activists, civil society organizations, and journalists, all of whom showed their support for the campaign. As Protect the Protest gains momentum, Amnesty International Ghana is calling on all Ghanaians to join the fight to protect the right to protest and ensure that all voices are heard in the country. <laughs> Journalists are so, we are so obsessed with the idea of being neutral that we are afraid to take a stand. How can you be neutral in moments of oppression? Yesterday, a 15-year-old boy, girl, was killed at Karaga Palace by military. Do I need to get the military side to state that it was wrong for them to go there to invade the palace and kill a 15-year-old boy because there's a chieftain's issue? Why were they there in the first place? So if we don't have an understanding of what it is that we are supposed to do, then we become victims of these. Also, I don't think that we are allowed, even in training, to get these. A lot of the things that I know about what a journalist is to do, I learned it on the job. Mm. It is not part of our school's training. Even to write, you do it on the job. So when, once we are in the profession, then we begin to learn. And that's why I'm always excited to sit next to um, Barker because I get to learn a lot. 
And, but without information, without reading and without understanding what it is that we are to do, or what is that is expected of these, whether it's the executive, the legislature, we cannot hold them accountable. Because each one of them is happy to protect its own. No one will give you that. I mean, um, I'm happy for institutions like Fact Check Ghana. Because what we have become are institutions of um, announcements. We're not doing journal, it's just an institution of announcements. A vice president says we've created 2.1 million jobs. And you can't say it's a lie, you just have to report it. And then another institution would come and say it is a lie, even though you can, because there's a fear of replications. One to the organization, where you work, you don't want to ruffle any feathers, you want, um, in quotes, you know, favors, because you want access to be able to talk to these same persons. But you really don't need that, but it's there. And unfortunately, we seem to have accepted it. And so it keeps happening and happening without us even realizing that we are being abused. Our rights are being trampled upon. That we literally have, ac we should have access to these and do our work. Journalists are so, we are so obsessed with the idea of being neutral that we are afraid to take a stand. How can you be neutral in moments of oppression? Yesterday, a 15-year-old boy, girl, was killed at Karaga Palace by military. Do I need to get the military side to state that it was wrong for them to go there to invade the palace and kill a 15-year-old boy because there's a chieftaincy issue? Why were they there in the first place? So if we don't have an understanding of what it is that we are supposed to do, then we become victims of these. Also, I don't think that we are allowed, even in training, to get these. A lot of the things that I know about what a journalist is to do, I learned it on the job. Mm. It is not part of our school's training. Even to write, you do it on the job. So when, once we are in the profession, then we begin to learn and that's why I'm always excited to sit next to um, Barker because I get to learn a lot. And, but without information, without reading and without understanding what it is that we are to do, or what it is that is expected of these, whether it's the executive, the legislature, we cannot hold them accountable. Because each one of them is happy to protect its own. No one will give you that. I mean, um, I'm happy for institutions like Fact Check Ghana because what we have become are institutions of um, announcements. We're not doing journal, it's just an institution of announcements. A vice president says we've created 2.1 million jobs and you can't say it's a lie, you just have to report it. And then another institution would come and say it is a lie, even though you can, because there's a fear of replications. One to the organization, where you work, you don't want to ruffle any feathers, you want, um, in quotes, you know, favors, because you want access to be able to talk to these same persons. But you really don't need that. But it's there. And unfortunately, we seem to have accepted it. And so it keeps happening and happening without us even realizing that we are being abused. Our rights are being trampled upon. That we literally have, ac we should have access to these and do our work. Journalists are so, we are so obsessed with the idea of being neutral that we are afraid to take a stand. How can you be neutral in moments of oppression? Yesterday, a 15 year old boy, girl, was killed at Karaga Palace by military. Do I need to get the military side to state that it was wrong for them to go there to invade the palace and kill a 15 year old boy because there's a chieftaincy issue? Why were they there in the first place? So if we don't have an understanding of what it is that we are supposed to do, then we become victims of these.
Also, I don't think that we are allowed, even in training, to... He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the Redeemer. And thank you very much for joining us on the Mother of All Talk Shows, Alaji and Alaji. We are live. We are live from the studio there. Osaji for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah Studios of Pan African Television. We are live on TV on Pan African Television. We are also live on radio on Radio Gold 90.5 FM. We are live, of course, on social media. Pan African Television is the page you should be looking for. I am Sena, Sena Nombo. This morning, we're having a discussion on the Dr. Baumier's search for a running mate. Yes, Dr. Baumier is looking for a running mate. But it's not one that is an advertised position that you can apply for. No. In fact, this week, it seems to have been the week where there was a discussion about what is called the top five. There are some people who have managed to sneak themselves back into the list because their name was not in the top five. Carefully placed stories. In fact, I am looking at one of them, which is from the Supreme newspaper, published on Wednesday, 27, 2024. MPP running mate. Natoshi tops all as calls with NPP for female VIP high. So depending on which paper you're reading, one person tops it or another person is topping it. There's been many stories planted in the various newspapers actively lobbying for who should be the running mate to Vice President Mahmoud Baumia, who is now flag bearer of the new patriotic party. So we'll be talking about that in our very first uh, discussion and then we'll move on to the supreme court's uh, ruling on the injunction application filed by honorable roxy nelson in fact people were taken aback when we heard that his injunction application was going to be heard because there was still outstanding an application that was filed uh, many about a week two weeks ago by richard de la sky on the matter of the bill that has been passed by parliament now, remember that it was Rox and Nelson that had post process based on which the speaker said, if I'm following the president's lead, I've decided that parliament will be adjourned in there. So we are going on recess because that's the example that the president has said will follow it. The, it seems that has been hurriedly dealt with, but parliament is still on recess anyway. There are questions that have been raised by the NDC and many lawyers about what they see as the selective scheduling of cases, that there's an attempt to, to force parliament back, whilst the issue that has to do with the president saying, I cannot receive a bill because there's an in, a pending injunction application has still yet to be comprehensively dealt with. So there are questions arising. And the speaker's lawyers, uh, they have also written to the chief justice that we also want you to schedule this particular case, the Richard Sky injunction application to be heard as soon as possible. Well, so we'll be talking about that and the developments on that front. And then we'll talk about the PRC and the energy minister's disagreement on the matter of whether or not a time a low shedding timetable should be issued the prc says a timetable should be issued as soon as possible the energy minister says if you have your own timetable uh, please bring it and in fact people have been developing their timetable and circulating on social media the problem is that the energy minister didn't tell all of us where we should direct the timetable to or whether you should place it on your front door based on your observation of how your light goes off when your light goes off so everybody's trying to figure out what he said and what it meant to the life of the Ghanaian who, they are, who is trying, trying, to trying to plan their lives around the constant power outages, which, in fact, you can predict yourself when your power will go off. Well, those are the issues we'll be discussing today. And joining me for this discussion this morning, nice to see him this morning, Ambassador Sampiala, is former Ghana High Commissioner to India, is president of the NDC Pro Forum. Ambassador, good morning. Good morning. I hope you're well. Great. Nice to see you. And as Ambassador Sam Piala is sitting right by him. His lawyer, Apia Dankwa, is a member of the Movement for Change, a private legal practitioner. Good morning. Yeah. Nice to see you. And then there's, uh, we'll be joined by Dr. David Percy. And then we'll also be joined by 
Mr. Uh, Kome Kwesi Pratt Jr. Um, we are expecting the two of them to join us to complete the panel for today. Once again, thank you very much for your time. And do share your comments with us. Use the WhatsApp line that we are displaying on the screen. And also, you can also uh, use the comment section of the various social media platforms on which you're watching us. And I'll read it as we go along in the show. Let's start the discussion off with the well, I'm just shopping for uh, Rani mates. And I'll start with Lawyer Pia Dankwa to my right. Lawyer, yeah, so good morning. Good morning. Uh, I hope you are doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to be in my senior's company. Mm. You know, uh, you have a right to say, we'll go way back. Because mm. I was actually my senior in the, in the law school. Okay. I was actually my SRC president. Okay. Uh, uh, I think we, that's, that's, there's always some level of Uh, give, give me a moment. Give me a moment. We have to take a quick break. Uh, we'll be right back. Land of freedom is the redeemer. He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the redeemer. Much for staying tuned, and of course, the lawyer was on the floor. Lawyer, so please it's continue. It's no, continue from where you live. <laughs> so, uh, so, essentially, the point I was making is that the most critical decision that the republic, the people, as in, need to make a big decision every four years, hopefully, uh, is 
the decision as to it goes as we place the executive powers of 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 state. Now, also the the, uh, the constitution, having had the benefit of history, history both in Ghana and history uh, the world at large, recognize the special role political parties can play in helping or making these decisions easier for the people. And, and I'm saying that the role the political parties can play because, you know, some time ago I came here and I spoke about political culture and then how political, the rights for the political culture uh, can play in sustaining democracy. Because political parties have that special ability to mobilize public opinion towards a certain end. And so, in the, in the, in the wisdom of the framers of our constitution, they, they felt the need to create a system where multi-party democracy could thrive, obviously regulated by the EC. So since 1992, a system we have we have practiced largely has been a system where Ghanaian sort of places uh, certain trust in political parties that help save and choose people and present them to us so that we make our decisions on them. And so in '92, if you recall, uh, NPP presented to Ghanaians Professor Edwin, NDC JJ Rollins. And there was the NCP, that is Kweku Watson's party. Also brought JJ on his to support J. Joy, NIP, Papa Dakon, People's Heritage Party, General Eskin, uh, what's called, uh, Neiman, as in his party, also, uh, I can't recall, uh, the PNP supported bringing Neiman. Now, we've had the benefit of having practiced our democracy for 32 years, for, for close to, for, 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 for just about a generation, more than. A generation and then what has become clear is that essentially the people of Ghana have seemingly placed their hope in two parties in the NPP and NDC that give us people give us people and then we'll make a decision on those people similarly that's that's what the people of Ghana seem to have consistently told uh, uh, the, uh, the parties in my view, that's a huge, that's a huge trust the people of Ghana have reposed in these parties. Unfortunately, that trust has not been reciprocated because there's always a danger with how political parties are formed and how they they eventually become. Because in '92, when the ban on political parties was lifted, what happened was that you found people who shared similar values as to how governance ought to be done, gravitating towards one political party or the other. And so initially, the reasons why people joined or formed political parties was based on an idea, an idea of how they felt governance ought to be to be done initially. Now, as time has, has passed and as uh, these two big parties have recognized the kind of trust the people of Ghana have placed into them. The original purpose for which they were formed has, uh, to borrow the words of Chemaun to me, transmogrified from ideas to very unfortunate uh, concepts. Uh, those concepts being concepts of clientelism, patronage, and to a very large extent, political entrepreneurship. Uh, now, now, I'm saying this because currently, in the kind of democracy we are practicing, because there's this huge belief that if the NPP chooses you as their presidential candidate, or if the NDC chooses you as their presidential candidate, then you, are, you have about 99% chance of eventually becoming the president of this country. Because if you take a critical look at uh, the political history of this country, as especially after 92, apart from Professor Edu Boain, anybody the MPP or the NTC has chosen as their presidential candidate has eventually become the, the, uh, the president of Ghana. Now, the danger in that is charlatans, charlatans, when I say charlatans, people who do not even believe in the ideas, the original ideas for which those parties were formed. Political entrepreneurs, charlatans, can 
use dubious means to enter those parties or dubious purposes to enter those parties, maneuver their way, play the game of thrones very well, and they may be chosen as presidential candidate. And once that is, that is done, they believe that based on the history, based on the history of this country, then there's a high chance of they becoming president eventually. It is these principles, principles of patronage, as in finding godfathers and trying to or seemingly serving those god godfathers well, principles of clientelism, principles of political entrepreneurship, that led to the MPP choosing His Excellency Dr. Mahmoud Bahamia. Because, Senna, if the, M the, 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 the MPP as a political party stayed true to the reasons why they were formed in the first place, and those reasons being in their belief that they had the best uh, ideas, they could attract the best talent to lead to the ultimate development of this country. Then having seen the monumental or calamitous failure of Nanado and Baumier's regime, especially the role Nanado purportedly gave Baumier to see to the transformation of this economy. And indeed, the Bamiya's own ad admission to, to, to that fact in his speech, in the speech when he outlined his visions for why he wanted to be to the president of Canada, especially in paragraph 63 and 665 six, of same, where he said that uh, he was tasked with the job of transforming the economy of Ghana and his approach was to do same by formalizing the economy because we all know that one of the biggest problems that our economy in particular is bedeviled with is our inability to raise revenue. And so, and, and the fact that un, the government's inability to raise revenue largely is because our economy or the actors in the economy are largely invisible to the government because they are is the informal sector largely that runs this economy. So, government is unable to really identify, pursue, and mobilize revenues to enable government to pursue its agenda. Now, if the person who led that effort has failed woefully to the extent that right now we've seen a situation where one of the fundamental principles, one of the fundamental beliefs in, in, in economics, let's say that the best place, the safest place to invest, to put your monies are the government bonds. As in, even though, though these principles have been breached under the watch of His Excellency Dr. Baumia. Now, where we have a situation where Dr. Baumia chastised uh, His Excellency Jomama for supervising the massive depreciation of the city. From the two cities he came to meet, two four cities as being the reasons why he was bringing his excellency to talk about me to tackle the issue of the depreciation of the city and to to see the city now almost over around 14 cities and yet the mpp in their wisdom felt that he, he was the person they need to present to Ghanaians to consider as the future as the president of this country clearly the mpp uh, have have taken a massive U10 on their core values and core principles. And I believe that uh, those sad principles, the principle of, like I'm saying, patronage, clientelism, political entrepreneurship, are the same principles that are going to guide His Excellency Dr. Baumia in his window shopping for a vice presidential candidate. Because for me, one thing that I'm mass massively surprised at is the fact that His Excellency Dr. Baumia, when he was Conversing for MPP's sponsorship of his presidential amb ambition, did not even did not tell the MPP why they should sponsor him. Because really, if the, the fundamental or the most basic purpose of the MPP or all political parties in Ghana are formed is to see the development of this country, then when somebody comes to you and conversates for your support for your, for your sponsorship and does not tell you his vision for the country. He does not tell you his plans for the that that will essentially lead to the transformation of Ghana, and you go ahead and sponsor him against candidates who have laid out comprehensive plans, plans that represents the best way of taking a country forward, like Alan John Kujuchimate did in his Great Transformational Plan. Bypass that plan, bypass his huge profile, Alan Chimate's huge profile, bypass his ma massive evidence of his leadership abilities both in the private sector and in his public service and 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 and, and chose as Bamiya, whose foray into uh, public 
service has been a monumental failure. Then it tells you that the only reason why they chose him is not because of Ghana. The only reason why they chose to sponsor him was because they felt that he could continue the perpetration of this great fraud that is being leveled on the people of Ghana to use the, the goodwill of the MPP, the name MPP, to use the goodwill, the, 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 the trust and belief people had in the original ideals and ideas and principles that led to the formation of the MPP, to present anybody at all to the people of Ghana to continue the perpetuation of this fundamental fraud that is being done against the people of this country. That, and, and, and I'm saying that is the same principles that is going to guide Bamiya and the MPP in their choice of who they think should become vice president of this country. After all, if Bamiya is saying that the vice presidential position is just a mid position, then why so why then why so much time and concentration uh, being had on on it? Because it is it's alleged that Bamiya said that he as he was used to do a lot of dirty work. So if, if the job is dirty then then unless there is an ulterior motive then I cannot understand why uh, uh, so much consideration is being had for the vice president, presidential candidate of the MPP. For me, I think, like happening in every country, the people who develop countries are there. As in people, or countries have developed because the people of the country themselves have had the courage to develop their countries. If you take the history of the world, uh, as in the the massive epochs that that changed the trajectory of 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 human beings. Talk about the cognizance revolution. You talk about the Greek revolution. You talk about the industrial revolution in its various forms. These are revolutions that have changed the trajectory of human existence. And all these revolutions happened because of serious commitment of the people themselves to change. Now 2024 election is a change election. 2024 could be one of the most important epochs in this country. You recall that at the beginning, I, I spoke about Ghana have, having had a, a, a number of epochs. You talk about 51, you talk about 57, you talk about the various instances when we had called 66, 16, uh, 69, 72, you talk about uh, issues in uh, 78 that ultimately led to the attempted revolt in May 15, 1979, June 4th, the 1st December 1981. I'm saying that. 2024 could 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 be recorded in the annals of this country as one of those years, but that would depend on the people of Ghana, because you see the kind of change we need, the kind of change we need is not necessarily a change in regime, because you see in 2000 we we asked for change, positive change, we had a change in 2008. Ghanaians asked for change, they had change. In 2016, there was another change. Now, the kind of change I think we need now is even beyond those simplistic changes. Because all the, those changes we had were simply changes of regime. What we need is a fundamental change in how things have been done. And one of those changes that I think we need is a radical change from this duopoly, which clearly hasn't helped us. You understand? I'll say it on this platform and I'll say it again. That when you, yeah, yeah, the fact is that we, we have a duopoly. When you say we have a duopoly, like I'm saying, we have made to believe, or there's this belief that unless you're a candidate that has been sponsored by the MPP or the NDC, then you have no chance of being president of this country. That has been the belief. And that belief is premised on how elections have been done or the results of elections from 1992. So, simply because of how things have been done, and in our first statements, you, you can have any idiot at all presented by the MPP or the NDC and Ghanaians who have serious considerations for that candidate. And, 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 and that kind of thinking, that kind of doing things has not helped us. Because like I'm saying, we've had that system for 32 years. What do we have to show for it? After 32 years, we have an economy that is, uh, as in to say the economy is on its knees is to, be, is to be charitable. We have an economy that is practically dead. We have an economy an economic system that is so you have an economic system 
that is essentially useless. Yeah, 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 because, so now, one thing that has been made clear, especially with the kind of communication that has gone on concerning whether or not the president should assent or not assent to the, uh, the bill that seeks to pr protect our values, is that memo that the Ministry of Finance said. For the Ministry of Finance to send a memo and say, that, listen, we appreciate the fact that this bill's focus is to protect the values of our country. And yet, Mr. President, don't ascend to the bill because if you do, we are going to lose three billion. Our economy is going to struggle. Essentially, then, then this is a country that is on the brink, or we are already uh, in, the, in the era of new colonialism. You understand? Because you, you recall, and he, or history has told us that when Kwame Nkrumah led us into independence in 1957, he recognized the need to build a strong economy because our inability or the, or the inability of our political independence to, to lead us to economic emancipation had the, the propensity to bring about what Kwame Nkrumah called new colonialism, simply a new colonialism. Because, yes, in all intents and purposes, you are free because you can choose your own leaders and all, but you cannot make decisions that would that will serve your best interests, or you cannot take decisions that reflect your core values because of the fear that those decisions could impact other sovereigns, other countries. And, 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 and why would my decision or my ability to make decisions be determined by other sovereigns. It will, it, will, it will only be seen because I'm dependent on those people for my economic survival. Now, Kwame Nkrumah obviously was speaking, having had the benefit of history. Because the United States of America also had a similar issue. In 1776, when Americans gained their in independence, at that time, their economy was being run, or the economy, the economic system was something similar to akin to what we had when we gain our independence. You understand? And, and what was that system? That system was an economy whose purpose was simply to provide raw materials for the established uh, countries in, in Europe. Because we should recall that in the 18th century, in the middle of the 18th century, we, the world had the Industrial Revolution. And at that time, Britain was the most industrialized nation in the world, the biggest economy in the, in the world. And for Britain, America being their colonies used was only to provide them with raw materials. Now, when America gained their independence in 1776, and all like us, they gained their independence by way of war. Then they had to declare their independence in the midst of a revolution. They recognized that unless and until their independence led to their economic emancipation, that there was a danger of their losing their independence again. And so, their first Secretary of, of their Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, put together a proposal, a proposal that sought to build or to make an American an economic powerhouse. Now, what was the focus of that proposal? That, the focus of that proposal was that unless America became an industrial powerhouse, unless they moved from being solely an agrarian economy to an economy that also could boost their manufacturing sector, then there was always a danger of they losing their independence back to the Great Britain. And so he put together a comprehensive program which recognized that manufacturing or industrialization can never succeed unless you put together a comprehensive protectionist policy, what he called the infant protection policy. Kamen Kuma had the same considerations when he became president in 1957. And it was those considerations that led to efforts to put together the Kosovo Dam was those efforts that led to the massive and radical industrialization agenda that Kwame Nkrumah undertook. And we, we call it, we call that agenda the import substitution agenda. Because the fact of, of the matter is that your political independence, unless it leads to your economic independence, can, can return you back to being col colonized. Maybe not in the system of form that we saw uh, when we were colonized under Britain. But in a different form. You could have your own flag. You could have the opportunity of electing your presidents. And still you'll be colonized. Because decisions or your ability to, to, to take decisions will be hinged on whether or not those decisions get approval from 
your so-called economic uh, dependence. Yeah, 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 and, 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 and those for me, those considerations are, are, are back. Now, when I say we need a change from, do, from the duopoly, we need a change from the duopoly because the duopoly is, as in, when they, when they are deciding who to sponsor, when they are putting four people to sponsor, they have, they, they really have massive concentration for the interest of, of Ghana. And that interest is to put, or to sponsor leaders who would push an agenda of transformation. And the recognition that that agenda for recognition, for uh, transformation can only be achieved if, first of all, you find a way of bringing Ghana together. To have a Ghana where we all recognize that our sole commitment eh, is to the Ghana agenda. Because right now we are very highly polarized. And we've never had a leader who's seen the sense in finding a way of bringing us together. We've run a system where even that polarization has even crept into the pol 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 political parties themselves. And so right now, you have a situation where in the MPP, if you are not in Nanado's camp, then forget. Yeah, 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 understand. So one, beyond the, the Nanado or our leaders failing to create a system where all of our interests will be, will be, will, will be fulfilled, and all of us, every Ghanaian has an interest in who becomes president. And our interest in to see Ghana doing well. Because if Ghana is well, if Ghana's economy is strong, if we, if we manage to build the right economic environment, then our talents can lead to our making some form of economic gain from them. Yeah, 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 you, uh, uh, you get the picture. And so essentially, we need a leader who, or we need a change that will lead us from that duopoly. We need that change, and that change can only be affected by the people of Ghana. You, you, uh, you, you open our airwaves and you listen to the con conversation, and it's as if uh, there are only two choices. Those choices being the choices of the people that the MPP has put forward and the NDC has put forward. But the 2024 election is a very different election for all. It's, it's, it's very different from any elections we've ever had. Because one, you have a former president. So you have somebody who has been given the opportunity to lead and transform this country. As in His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. And you have somebody who claims, who tells, to be the most effective vice president we have ever had. And he says he's a mate. Being sponsored by the MPP and the NDC. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because they're the only people who have tested some form of uh, 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 called, executive power at the very top. But there are other candidates. We have Alan John Kodo Chairman. He's not being sponsored by anybody. He's being sponsored by himself. The fact that he's not being sponsored by any political party, the fact that he's not being sponsored by the MPP or the NDC, does not mean that Ghanaians should not consider his, his having put himself up to be considered for the position of president. Because at the end of the day, like I said, Per the tenets of our constitution and per what we've seen, not once or we do not put executive powers in the hands of the political parties. We put executive powers in the hands of human beings. So that if we want correct and proper change, then it is important that for the first time, we consider the person, the character, the integrity, the vision, the dream of the human being putting himself up as president. It is very critical. Otherwise, we won't have change. It's very critical, and that we consider beyond their track record what they say they will do, but the vision they are, they are putting across. Because I've listened to uh, uh, Bamiya's vision, which really for me, uh, that vision should even see the light of day, taking having as in taking into into consideration his performance as well, as, as well, and the tenets of the vision, which is all over the place. I've listened to His Excellency John Mama's 24-hour economy. I don't know if that is the version. Because really, the 24-hour economy will be a natural consequence of transformation. You understand? So, the 24-hour economy, yes, it's an idea that, that, that every transformed economy uh, would want. You understand? But that is the consequence of certain 
actions. And I'm yet to be convinced about uh, not just the commitment, but understanding of those actions that will lead to that 24-hour economy. But we also have another vision, which really is in the form of a plan, the Great Transformational Plan. Beyond its proposing policies, that clearly recognizes that to, to use our political independence to attain economic independence requires that we are not only highly industrialized, but that government supports the sprouting up of manufacturing hubs and also the protection of same. You understand? And, 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 and so when I say recognizing beyond the, rec the recognition of industrialization, but also recognizing the fact that to be truly transformed, then you need to support the springing up of manufacturing hubs. Because you can, industrialization can be a process in which you can even speed up agriculture. So if agric is highly mechanized, that means that you can resort to the use of machines to increase or transform agric. And when I say agric, to move agric from a low productive venture to a high productive venture. Beyond the economies, we are talking about a transformation, a vision that says that, listen, beyond moving Ghana beyond the geopoly, I'm, I'm going to provide leadership that will make true the focus of democracy. Because when you define democracy, or the, 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 def the, def the definition of democracy that is very popular now, is the definition of democracy that says that democracy is not only power government of the people, but it's government by the people and for the people. So that democracy is not just elections. Democracy is not just every four years we're going to uh, a, a queue to, to cast our vote. But democracy also includes finding a way of including the people in government. An all-inclusive government. A government that is not limited to just the actors of our political space. A government that seeks to include people from the business community, people from ac academia. A government that seeks to include all Ga every Ghanaian into the decision-making process. That's the kind of leadership we need. Also, a leadership that says that, listen, this winner takes all kind of leadership is really killing our ability to deliver transformation to our people. And so, why don't we form a government of national unity where the, your political coloring will not really be critical? And that what will be critical is your commitment, your commitment towards the Ghana agenda, towards the transformation of this country. That's the kind of leadership we need. And that's the kind of leadership Alan John Martin is promising. Should the reason why that fantastic dream and vision not be considered be only because he's not in the MPP or the NDC? Is that what the people of Ghana are saying? Should we sit down for this duopoly, which really has not led us to be transformed econ economically? This duopoly that is essentially further polarizing, deepening the polarization of the people of, of this country. This duopoly that is bringing issues of tribalism and ethnocentrism to the fore. Because when you listen to the MPP, when they are talking about their, their constitution of vice president, it's like if you are not an Ashanti right now, then you have no chance of being the vice president, the vice presidential candidate of the MPP. You understand? Now, and, and, and we all know, if you understand the history of this country, the fact that for people who were born this in the 20s or in the, or, in the, or in the 30s, or probably even in the 40s, what is President Day Ghana was essentially about four or five countries. The Northern Territories, Ashanti, Gold Coast, Trans, Water Togoland. You understand? For Kwame Nkrumah to bring all us together as one, to form that one Ghana, and for we on the altar of partisan politics to attempt the division of our country. Why should we still be held bond, bond, bonded? As in why should we be still, still be hold on to this duopoly which really is not delivering the kind of leadership we need? To, not to, as in to, uh, to, uh, to end here. I just want to say that we need a radical change. We need to change from this duopoly. We need a change that will recognize that we need a one Ghana agenda. We need a change that 
will be the provision of a leadership that would bring proper inclusive government. We need a change that will attempt to change the attitude of Ghanaians. We need a change that will lead to the radical paradigm shifting of the economic structures of this country. Because, I, because if there's one thing that is clear, once again from history, that the free trade system that we are, we are practicing now, because you know, you, know, you, know, you know I mentioned a number of epochs, and I mentioned 82 too. Because in 82, there was a radical shift from the economic, system, uh, economic structure that we were, we were practicing to a free trade one. Meanwhile, history has told us that the countries that are pushing this free trade agenda, Great Britain, the USA themselves, Western Europe, none of these countries got transformed on the premise of free trade. That all these countries, Great Britain, the USA, the Western economies, got transformed on the principle of a highly protectionist or in fact protection agenda. And they only resorted to free trade after those their protectionist agenda has led to the building up of their manufacturing hubs to levels where they could compete on a global level. It was only at that stage where they opened themselves to free trade. And so then, for we as, as, as a people, for us to resort to, to free trade, when because of unnecessary partisan considerations, we oppose Kwame Nkrumah's industrialization agenda. That agenda that led to the destruction of almost all the industries that he built. And went to free and went and took upon ourselves this free trade agenda when we had not managed to build for ourselves strong a strong economy or a strong product, production hub to compete on the global level. We need a change from even that economic system to a system that is essentially protectionist. A system that will use all the principles, economic principles of protecting our own, be it tariffs, be it subsidies, be it a quota system, to build a local industry to lead to the transformation of Ghana and cause the ability of the Ghanaian business, Ghanaian products to compete on the international inter stage. That's the kind of change we need. And certainly, Dr. Baumia does not represent that change. What Dr. Baumia represents is a continuation of this politics of patronage, clientelism, this politics of self-serving. That's the kind of politics or the kind of leadership or the kind of yeah, leadership Dr. Baumia represents. His uh, uh, John Damani Mahama eh, does also not represent does not represent that change also. Because really, if you consider John Mama's candidature, the reason why it has an out of popularity now is because of the calamitous failure of Nanado Mbamia. Granted, if you ask me, as in when His Excellency John Mama was leaving power, I thought we couldn't see a leadership worse than him, than his leadership. Certainly Nanado's leadership is worse than Mahama. But my brother here will agree with me. Now, in landlord, there's a principle, a very famous principle in landlord, that you do not win any land case on the weakness of your opponent's case. You win the case on the strength of your own case. You understand? And so I'm asking Ghanaians that they should not fall for or, or, or give or to spit and pick up their spotting back only because of the calamitous failure of Nanado. And that what we should lead, and only us can lead that, is to vote for change. And that vote for change is the vote for Alan John Kojo Chemantin's great transformational plan. That is what we should we should we should vote for. is a member of the movement for change, starting a discussion on the running mate. Uh, Dr. Baumia is window shopping for a running mate, and uh, many names have been mentioned this week. In fact, initially the names that came up, uh, I was surprised to hear the name of uh, Honorable Renato Shiado. Uh, her name has come up. So, uh, the name of uh, the chief of staff, Madam, uh, 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 the, uh, the chief of staff has come up consistently. Yeah, her name has come up consistently. The name of, of course, Napo was seen to be in the lead. He was the leading candidate for the position. Uh, that's Dr. Matthew Pokupemba, who is the energy minister. His name is, is also still in the race. There's the name of Dr. Osei Duchum, who is education minister. And of course, there's the name of Kojo Poku, who just come up. 
Kojo Poku's name was raised as the five. In fact, the initial story, that was the five names that were published. Subsequently, I've seen people trying to bring in the name of uh, Osei Chiman Sabonzu, the, 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 the former majority leader, and also the name of Madame Osula Osu, who is the Minister for Communications. So those are the names that have been mentioned. But uh, my friend at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Dr. Amachi Boatin, says that the only con the very uh, form the foremost consideration is that the person must be from the Ashanti region. That's the foremost consideration. So anybody in there who is not from the Ashanti region, uh, first of all, does not qualify to be considered. That the running mate must come necessarily from the Ashanti region. Um, Ambassador Sampiare. Thank you very much. And, uh, good morning to your viewers who have not seen me for a long, long time. Mm. But every day I watch your program. And <clears throat> today, my junior mm -hmm. and, uh, has confirmed that he's a very smart guy. Mm -hmm. Very, very smart. He was smart in school when he has exhibited you today. The topic for discussion was the NPP's uh, Bawamia's running mate. But as smart as he is, he tried to jumble it to an Alan Chamantin campaign. I have a great deal of respect for Alan, and the campaign for or against him has not started. But for or against him has not started, and you have taken the lead. But to say that people should vote for Alan Chan Martin over John Mahama is one of the calamitous statements you can ever make, if I should borrow your own words. On account that Alan has been in the system, this rotten system, all his life. And that if he had been elected the flag bearer, he would still have been with MPP. So that discussion is for another day. Let us come to what you have asked us to come and discuss. And to add that we in the NDC since the NDC was formed, we have always known our leaders or who our leaders will be, NDC. So apart from Professor Mercer's time where Eddie Annan and the rest tried to contest uh, Professor Mills, you remember, NDC we have always known. And even the result that came, you knew that the NDC was decided before even we went to the Congress. When we went to Sinyani to face Nana Kunedu Ajaman Rollins, the, the, sitting, uh, the president, former president's own wife, we also said, show that, no, no, president, we love you, but we don't want your wife here, here around us. So as for NDC, we always know who our leaders will be. Not because of patronism, not because of cronyism, not because of anything, but because of the character and, you know, the quality of the leaders that we have. Why are we bringing John Mahama back, even though he has one term of office? We are bringing John Mahama back because he is the only one with experience. He was he's the only one with proven capacity to 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 bring to to bring up Ghanaians to repair the rot. You, Alan Chan Martin, and the rest of MPP has brought to this country. That's the only reason why we are bringing. Your mama. Sana, you have asked me to give my view about Baumia's running mate. No, so. Mm. I was thinking that the MPP having boasted all the time that we have the men, and unfortunately I don't hear them say this time anymore that we have the men. If I've just taken them just one minute to select a running mate, just one minute to select a running mate, and let us examine the factors that has inhibited them in themselves from selecting a running mate you know npp used to run a campaign of tribal campaign if you go to certain parts of the country you see they still do it they they run a system of I mean, a campaign system 
who says that your man tough one day so do you understand what i'm saying it was a crying crawl yeah my take tennis in the end you know because mahama was from the north because mahama was from the north yeah my ten in there so today was the story and let me give you a classical illustration of yeah martini in the so remember joshua kamba was passing through a school and the students saw him and they started complaining about their plight you remember then we have one buffoon of a regional minister buffoon of a regional minister take to the mic and I was, I was, gee, it took the Santé Hine to douse the, 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 the trouble because of the, what that, that was generating. For the Santé Hine to say that, look, young canon, only a coffin crop for fee, a straw, a befire man, and San Omar, away. Do you remember that? I can see it. I can see it. It took that something to douse the, the tension. But this buffoon of a regional minister, openly, when you were sitting in Kumasi, which, which regional minister? Ashanti regional minister, the, 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 the correct one. The one who went to give that interview. Yes, that one. Uh, was trying to remember. Mm -hmm. the, you didn't know what he had done. Oh, that he, one. Yes, that one. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, that is a classical uh, illustration of how tribalistic myopic the MPV had been. They had forgotten that Ali Mahama, that respected uh, vice president, was also from the north. They have forgotten that Tolona was also from the north. So the MPP for a long time have been playing the politics of convenience. Uh, they can slash your hand, cut it off to win. And then when they are sitting they are forgotten that they themselves have cut your hand. There was then PP. Then Mahama, John Mahama went and said, look, these people, watch them. They will use you and dump you. Oh, then they decided that then we elected Northern as a regional as a, as a flag bearer. Senna, the records are that. To confirm what my brother in Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklu said, but for Akufado, Baumia will not have been even a regional chairman of the party. No, because he had never attended even a branch meeting of the MPP when he was elected. So he elected as a running a running mate, a lie. He had never, and in fact. Baumia's parents, both parents are known NDC members. Baumia's mother, Hadia, was a, is a known NDC member. And the father became our council of uh, state uh, chairman. Baumia's senior brother, right, was a colleague ambassador in Burkina Faso. And he's still a member of the NDC. Speculations are that Baumia himself wanted to become the running mate of the NDC. So they have elected him as our the running mate and the flag bearer of the NPP. And all of a sudden he's been pushed on us and that he's going to be our salvation hmm. as for that we are going to come on that what Baumia represent we are going to come on that when the real issues come but today you say we should this guy is running mate isn't it hmm. Senna, the NPP now now NPP is cast in a mold that if you don't elect somebody from Ashanti region we shall not win the election. No, so. So today, the qualification of any person becoming Baumia's running mate is that is is from Ashanti region. That one. Sena, the Ashanti region since 1992 
has turned about 42 MPs since 92. 42 MPs, including those who name, whose names are being mentioned. It took that Shanti Jini himself, Nana, to now solicit Talasulala to repair the Kumasi, uh, uh, what? Confanachi Hospital. Ashanti region has produced a bunch of MPs, loud mounted MPs all across, who have never done anything for the Ashanti region. And I'm told when you go to Kumasi, the only place that I've seen development is uh, uh, that place where M as NDC MPs, what's the name? Asawasi. They themselves see it. And you have this buffering of a regional minister again sitting in front of a camera and being asked how many projects can you say are your flagship project in ashanti Sena, that was a disaster of an interview the man sat, sat down several hours, several minutes and couldn't say what they have done in ashanti he was being truthful he was being truthful because i haven't done anything for ashanti and so anybody from ashanti being elected the uh, running mate based solely on the qualification that is from the Ashanti region, is meaningless. Because the people of Ashanti would these days not go back to the ancient history of saying that, oh, now, nah, men and I, yeah, we're not M MPP, which means be MPP. That is, that era is gone. They used to say, we have three things, Otufo, Kotoko, and MPP. These days, the story is different. And if you look at the uh, 2020 election, the NDC did better in Ashanti than even our stronghold voter region. Right? Am I right? Yes. And we, Sana, watch my lips. We, NDC, we know what we are doing in Ashanti region. We know what we are doing in Ashanti region. We will surprise them like eclipse. Now look at the names that have come. Look at the names that have come to be elected as running mates. If even it is true. These days, if you have some money, um, I, don't, I don't know, and can get some tablet to say uh, Sambi Yale is leading, then you are leading. You remember that the first time Baumia was actually uh, presented as running mate was some months ago at Aliza. And they said they, said they, didn't, they didn't like it. We are waiting for them. Look at the person who you said was the front, front runner. Mm. Look at him. Matthew Puku Prempe. No so. Mm. I used to like him a lot. And you see, when you want to know the character of a person, wait until he speaks. Then you know who he is. You remember when parents were frustrated? Parents were frustrated because of the posting to of a uh, secondary school student and they came to the independent square upon your own invitation that you should come so that people will take care of them in an interview all you said oh Bahama is they have, they have been buzzed by Bahama oh put that aside a school reported that they didn't have a toilet my mere favorite toilet toilet but Umiya's favorite project, toilet, which even assemblymen don't want to commission. That's what the, pres the, the vice president specialty is, toilet, toilet. Then Napo, Napo told them, go and, go and, excuse me to say, it's too early in the morning, go and use politan box. Have you forgotten? Are we going to have such a vice president? Just because it's an Ashanti. See, see, council, have you listened to Ashanti, Ashanti Hene? And the wisdom he has used when he speaks. So, Napo cannot say because he's Ashanti, he should be elected. Because compare what he says in public to what Ashanti Hene does in public. I see that was not enough. There is doom so. There is light off. Me, I, I call it uh, uh, transformer because they say we should call it transformer. They don't want it to be called doom. So, so me, I call it. They say they are changing transformer. Seven years they have changed transformers, so I call it transformer. And this 
transformer or doom so whatever you, you he himself calls it doom cc has killed children at Tema Tema Hospital. It becomes a matter of concern. Senna, they ask you and look at the rude arrogance. Napo, you are not the first minister of energy. I'm telling you, if you go to your office on, on Tuesday, you will see pictures of several persons who have become ministers of energy before. Not so. What right does, do you have to tell us those who say you, they want a uh, timetable, they should go and uh, uh, bring timetables? You want to be a, 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 a what? Running mate? You see, those who the gods want to destroy, then they come to who else? Who, who else you say the second, second runner? My friend Educhu. I must concede that Educhum had done far, far better in education than his former boss, Napo. Because the, the STEM program he is bringing, I think is interesting for our educational system. But he himself has some skeletons in his, in his cupboard. You remember that, whether it's true or not, people were allowed to be using his name and password to be collecting money, monies from people for the uh, placement of schools in schools. Sana, you remember? Yeah. As a minister, your password and name is being used to collect monies from people. What has he said about it? We are going to elect him because he's from Ashanti. Now that wound to me has been proved wrong that a female can be a running mate because to him a female can never be a running mate. You see the MPP was it trying to bring the faces of running mates. Before I go on, Chief, you are from the MPP. Do you have a, do you have shame at all? I'm not from no, you used to be. No, no, I'm not from MPP. Sana. Sana, this political party, you, there's allegation that your own, your, you yourself are alleging that Don Kuma did not die of a natural death. They themselves were alleged, you know. Not me, not you, not uh, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Pesci. You themselves were alleging. At his funeral, at his funeral, the widow, the, 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 the widow and everybody was sitting there. No, so yeah. chiefs were sitting there. Tradition was being observed. Is that the place you, are, you have to sing happy birthday to Akufuado? Sena, is that the place to, to sing uh, the birthday of Akufuado? So the MPP has now moved from a political party into, a, into a, a, a bunch of wagons. They don't respect themselves. They don't respect anybody. Believing that once they win Ashanti, they have won the country. Their NDC is running mate. The NDC is running mate. You know the NDC is running mate? Yeah. Nana Opoku Anjiman. Jin Nana Opoku Anjiman was not sought for because he's from Ashanti from the West, Central region. He was not sought for because he was a woman. Nana Opokwajiman was selected because he was a woman of women. A woman who on her own has broken the grass in the academia. A lie. A lie. Tell me what are the lie. That he has broken the grass in on your academia. On her own as... Jena Nobugajiman is the first female vice chancellor. I don't like to say that it's the best university in UCC. No, it's, 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 it's not. The best university is KNUST. Hmm. <laughs> what, what about you, my friend? I, I, I want to boost. I'll say the you best university is KNUST. <laughs> Sena, Nano Bugajiman is not just 
a woman. Oh. You know his, his, what he said? I am a woman, I know. But I have opened the door. I wouldn't close it so that more women can pass through. What else do you want? You were talking about leadership and transformation, not so. Yeah. Leadership. Who else can be our running mate than a woman who was the vice chancellor? What did he show at the, at the UCC? Is it not leadership? Is it not competence? Sana, is it not competence we are looking for? Are we looking for Nando Kupukwajan because he's from my, my village? Uh, 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 oh, you have forgotten your own village. No, no, uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> You you are like the, the Ashanti regional minister. You no, no I'm not like you. <laughs> so I'm not like you. See, we didn't elect Nana Pokwajima because he's from Komenda. We didn't elect Nana Pokwajima because uh, some some fanciful ex ex reasons. We elected Nana Pokwajima because of her competence, integrity, loyalty. We are waiting for which woman they will bring. Sana, why did you even make this a topic? For me, when the bucket is down, the content is not necessary. Because the content is gone. Was it not Baumia himself who said, if the president uh, or the leader is incompetent, the flag, flag valor doesn't mean anything. You yourself, Baumia, you, Baumia, you yourself. Your competence level is below, below, far below zero. Far below zero. Listen to him. Listen to Baumia. If you elect me, I will give you um, task, what? Exemptions. Amnesty. Thank you very much, counsel. If tax exempt amnesty is good for Ghanaian businessmen, you are the vice president. Why don't you go to the president and say, Mr. President, let us introduce tax amnesty so that Ghanaian businessmen will be happy. You went to the port, you said what? Paperless port. Whatever, whatever, what you call. Today, our port in Tama and Takradi are empty empty you tell us we are going to move from taxation to what production and you you you, you scammed us with industries phantom industries Sana, this country needs a halt All right so that we can reboot because this MPP government has transgressed and destroyed every institution in Ghana. Look at our water bodies. Senator, if you look, read the constitution, the president is the custodian of all our natural resources, including our water bodies. So the score, the scorecard, the scorecard of Akufuado number one is that he is the president who supervised the destruction of our water bodies. Before I forget, before I forget, you remember the president brought some gold catches, hundred of them, eh? gold catches, and established the community mining groups. Question is, when these community miners extract the gold, and who, who, who owns it? The community mining. Who owns the gold? The gold extractors, who did Akufado give to? Eh? Who did Akufado give the gold extractors to? Who owned the community mining? Who, which had destroyed our water bodies? Sena, look at our education system. Parents who are not paying school fees for free SHS are so happy. But parents, don't forget that you don't send a child to school at 
four years, uh, free SHS at four years. Do you? You go through a system, primary school, you struggle to pay those fees before you become a go to the free SHS. The free SHS council, you people brought, was vote catching like gold. It was for, for, for vote catching. These are the people who are turning 18, isn't it? And so let us catch them. That was the purpose. Otherwise, a good policy like that should have Kwame Nkrumah said that free education, isn't it? From primary school. Then you said, Baumia, you said that what? <laughs> one district, one dam. Your own place. Are the dams there? The last time I checked, you, Dr. Baumia, you even sent expired what? Goods to your people for Ramadan. Expired. Have you forgotten? Yeah. Expired product. Not knowing that there's a cabal in his office that go to port to, to take people's rice. And the kid is in court now. That people from his office were using his letterhead to go and take people's rice on demolish. Vice president. Vice president. And I want to end. I'm not a Muslim. But one of the tenets I've learned from Islam is that a married woman should cover the hair, the head, isn't it? The hair. Mahomia is the only vice president whose wife dresses like ordinary. And you call somebody incompetent. Whatever or whoever becomes the vice president of the NPP is just coming for decoration. That people of Ghana will vote for him because he has elected Napu. Edichum, Natoshi, doesn't mean nothing. Look at Daya, the adult, look at Daya. What we have seen in, under this government, that today, Akufwadu cannot simply sign an, a bill or bills that has come to his office just because we are going to lose three billion. Wow. Baumia, where is your competence? What have you advised the president to? Uh, today, I uh, hear yesterday he was in the uh, Presby Church. Presby Church. Yesterday. Hmm. Baumia is a, is a contradiction, a bundle of contradictions. Uh, let me end here. But for me, one of the falsehood of history is Bagomir's entry into politics. The one of the falsehoods. Because before, when he became the flag bearer of MPP, he was not even a member of the MPP. True or false? Council, true or false? Yes. He was not even a member of the MPP. Until as I see radio said his British citizenship was a clerical error. You know this issue came up that he had married a British which he had not denied. He was he had a British citizenship. He didn't deny. All he took was assassin radio saying that it was a clerical error and Ghanaians believed it. One day the truth will come out. But I pray to Ghanaians that never again should be vote NPP because of what they have done to this country. And let me add, Council, you said Kwame Nkrumah said something. It's like new colonialism. Yeah. It's like two people fighting, two families fighting for a property. So now you are the rightful owner, isn't it? But Council is a lawyer. So he, he fight with you until, uh, may God forbid, you die. Then his relatives are still alive. All right, his relatives are like that. What do you think will happen? No wonder they have reversed or sought to reverse everything Kwame Nkrumah did. But history is an interesting character. History, you know, when we were in Ghana 10 at 50, it was NP and the NPP. You remember? Mm. <laughs> Any 
national historical event happens under the MPP. Because God wants them to see that what they did to this country is not right. Okay. Including putting pictures of persons who don't deserve to be on our currency as so-called big six. It's another falsehood which we shall which address under that time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. If you just join us, the mother of all talk shows, Alaji and Alaji, we are live from the Osajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah Studios of Pan African Television. Um, let me do it. Uh, let me say a big thank you to Shine FM in Akachi on 96.9, Hills FM in Adakulo 91.7, Nuasi Radio is in Kete Krachi on 89.7, Sela Radio in Dabala on 97.1, there's Namon FM in Tamale on 93.7, Bewa Radio in Yendi on 106.5, Rick Dawin in Saboba on 95.7, Benya FM Elmina 105.7, Global FM in Ho 105.1, there's Zebs FM 95.1. 95.9 in Zebila, True FM 92.5 in Adeso, Lamara FM 89.1 in Triponi, Buem 88.7 FM in Jessica, and there's Lucusi 96.1 in Vergo Lokwati, there's Tyne FM 90.9, there's Sekwele FM 104.3 in Liquid Todome, uh, Akpini Radio in Kwando. Thank you. Uh, a big thank you to all this radio station. We are live on all of them as we speak. Doc. Good morning. Good morning, Sena. You are asking me to engage in a very difficult exercise. So, um, basically, you're asking me to stand in tones and to pick out tones, which is not something to be advised. But, well, I'll give it a shot. I think our topic is about mere window shops mm. for running me. That's quite wicked. Because uh, running me has to come from within the MPP, yeah. I believe. Yes, OK. Now, really? Figure out what is unfolding. Um, but we all have only one lifetime. So we can relate it to events that occur within, within, within our span. But I'm going back to the today's MPP. We started out life as an Ashanti party, as the NLM. It was put together with the people who were then the vanguard of the CPP, the likes of uh, Victor Osu, Aram Ponsa. Joe appear for the purposes of an Asante agenda when the matter of the independence of the Gold Coast was on the table. Because Asante man had a completely different take on what independence meant. One thing that many Ghanaians have not recognized is that the British Gold Coast itself, I mean the formalization of the British Gold Coast, starting with the bond of 1844, started out as a response to Asante So it started out with nine fancy states seeking the protection of the British. In the course of which the British, with these allies, an expanding group of allies, on the, mostly on the coast, 
went to war with Asante on several occasions, culminating in the final defeat of Asante in 1900. And I think uh, my friend, uh, lawyer, Happy Adam has spoken to the, um, you could say the four nations that came together, that became the Gold Coast that went into Ghana. The colony, which is basically what became of this thing that started out with the nine fancy states joined by all the states along the, the coast and going inland to include places like Kweu, Seshi, okay. That's the colony proper, the Transvolta, Togolam, um, but maybe I'm, I'm listening, that should even come in last. Then Asante, we came in through conquest, the northern territories that came in through treaty, they made a choice as to whether to go with the British or the French. And then Transvolta Togoland, which was essentially a partition of German Togoland between the French and the British, the spoils of the First World War. So these are the four component parts of what became the Gold Coast that went into Ghana. Then you could also at another level speak about at least 55 ethnicities, some of them states properly speaking many of them in the process of state formation. Okay. And what was required was a negotiation. Not just between this grouping with the British, but a negotiation amongst them as to what was to be the nature of governance. For Santiman, it was, we are taking back our country. Come again. Yes, we are taking back our GMI. But for the mind for them included all of the coast. So the option for the coastal states was to return to either vassals colonized or enslaved peoples because what had happened in this space over the course of several hundred years in the, in the, in the, in the, in the period of slave trade was well, Asante became the dominant power because it controlled the trade. All the slave routes passed through Asante. And when the Asante states got together and were through the Inshra power, they were the, the hegemon, the number one power. This matter was never properly discussed. For a period, Asante supported the development of what would become the CPP. One, because it kept the youth busy and out of the way. But then if you're an ethnic state, who are you going to rely on to fight your battles? But the youth. So Nkrumah's policy of a detribalized youth became an existential threat. 
not just to Asantiman, but to all the ethnic states. Okay? And it took a number of factors. Running up to the 1954 election, it was to decide the nature of the Gold Coast in its run up to independence. The CPP had promised that they, I think they would increase the price of cocoa. That was one. Then one of the things that we also failed to recognize, because in the Gold Coast, colonialism was essentially a joint venture between the chiefs and the colonialists. So independence really meant an overthrow of the power of the chiefs, if not wholly, at least in part. So you had this 54 election that was supposed to settle matters because there had been disputes from the first election. We had um, half of the assembly elected, half of people nominated by quote-unquote tribal councils. And Nkrumah, I think, has set in motion um, a reform, local government reform, that would have the local authorities established in taking charge of land and other matters. This was a dangerous mix. So the elections happened. A downturn meant that the CPP could not fulfill the promise of raising the cocoa price. Then you had this attempt to reform land administration and put the local councils in charge. And this was really what came together, sparked what would become the NLM. The National Liberation Movement it was very interestingly named. National Liberation Movement was basically for a sentiment. Okay. And the motive, the engine, the driver for that were the militants in the CPP, the youth. So there was a fatwa declared. I mean, they invoked the, the great oath and made it an act of treason for the Asante youth to remain in the CPP. A few royals were left in the CPP, some of whom would become Trojan horses, more or less. But that was the beginnings of today's NPP founded as a party for Asantiman, which for convenience has to pretend that it is not Ashanti publicly, in the open. But as my uh, senior said, when they're campaigning, when they're speaking to each other, they know what they're about. Okay. A lot of the stuff that he said is not something that's fit for uh, morning television, so I will not repeat it. But that is the conjunction that we have. Now, over the course of two terms, having taken control of the MPP through Fagri, President Anado has attempted to craft a party without the Asante core. Clever, but we can 
reliably rely on Asante votes. So you have a party, and as, that started out as an Ashanti party, that can reliably rely upon to deliver Ashanti votes, but to serve other ethnic agendas. And the final chapter of this either attempt, success, successful so far, is his imposition of Baumia, who started out with no history in the party, but it doesn't really matter. Because what has been assigned for him is that he wants to pass over power to him so that he can reliably sit on the lap of Nanando and be told what to do. I'm saying this because in the last few weeks we've heard about what well, they know of that speech he gave where he effectively said that he was now going to be his own man. Yeah. I'm borrowing the words of the late uh, Professor Mills. He didn't quite say that, but that was what he meant. Yeah. He said, now, I'm only a mate. Mm -hmm. huh? Give me the... The steer. The steer. Yeah. And I'll be my own man. Which is utterly false. I know it is convenient for my friends in the NDC to say that Bahamia has been an absolute failure in managing the economy. The simple truth was that he was never in charge of any economy. But that makes the situation worse because he was part of a con. It was part of an elaborate con that was so the Ghanaian people. His only claim to that, being part of that team, was a buffoonery before the Supreme Court. You and I were not there. Which just confirms what my former MP said about the MPP. To go ahead in the MPP, you must be prepared to do and say foolish things. So his claim, I mean, he really connected with the base of the party. I cannot speak of fool. <laughs> he really connected with the party. Yes, that is it. He's a, he's a man. To say that he's not popular in the, inside the party is to be, is to lie. But that's because he could say and do things that are clearly silly. Okay? And that, that immediately connected him with the base of the party. Now, the persons who have run the economy has been our friend, Mr. Ken Oferiata, the smart guy, who will continue to run the economy, this time without any formal responsibility. The fancy footwork that has gone on in the Ministry of Finance is just for the whole polloi. The economy will continue to be run by the president's. What the, has he been given a formal title? Special. Yes. Yeah. For what? For foreign international finance. Yeah, foreign, because he knows where all the loot has been buried. It's not about going to the capital market, because you cannot go there for a long time. But a lot of money has been sorted away in all kinds of investments. And he's a specialist in that. So he's, be, he's going to be responsible for the domestic economy in terms of all the big, big, large item decisions. And also for these other things, all of them directed at taking commanding control of the Ghanaian economy. 
So that is really what has been highlighted by what is going on now. So you have an Ashanti party and a certain attempt to re-establish control of the party. That was signaled by the appointment of the campaign, what do you call it? Campaign um, advisory team. Yes. Yes. The whole of the party leadership, formal leadership. Huh? It's a council of elders and, mm. okay, plus one reverend, and uh, which includes President Kufo. Everybody. That's basically an attempt to take over the party, which has been, they all acknowledge, has been wrecked by the president. So it puts them in a very interesting situation. They fully deserve to lose this coming election. You are just looking at the dynamics. But they intend to win. If they win, they have their party back. If they lose, they can put it all on the head of the Pepini. Not them. So they are sitting pretty. So everybody, I mean, if you look at the campaign organization, everybody is in there. Everybody is in there. And it's for a reason. So now back to the issue of the who is going to be the running mate. I can't see any name that inspires me. And maybe it doesn't really matter. Because the main issue is about the cabal that controls the MPP now that controls the president is staying in power and running a third term, hopefully, <laughs> with Baumia firmly under control. He, ha he cannot and he will never be his own man. So even as he comes and tells Ghanaians that, look, I'm only the meat, everything is campaign is being determined by others. Everything. But that's where the crisis begins to mature because now you must finally make a choice which will hopefully keep everybody together. Not so. Okay. A few weeks ago, the NDC had a similar situation. Okay. Um, some people who are hoping that uh, they were foolish enough to bring up a new face. Yes. Yeah, there are people who are betting that the NDC were foolish enough. I said, look, it will be completely unnecessary. Because the rest of the period we spent on why and all kinds of stupid, you know, distractions. The NDC has its own issues. We can talk about that. For instance, I, from, the, from my perch on the sidelines, I see an interesting parallel between how some people in the NDC have taken on to this 24-hour uh, economy in much the same way as the NPP did with free education. Free SHS. Free SHS, free education, yes. Free, free, free education, that was what they were saying. Okay? As a panacea for everything. Whether you've got cocoa or whatever. <laughs> free education. But he's made a very interesting point that a 24 hour economy will be a function of transformation. You are going to transform this rotten base. What will the free economy be doing? Importing stuff. 24-7 from other economies. Because that's, that's one of the possible outcomes if you don't have a comprehensive program. 
every time I'm on a set with descendants of the or people who have been associated with the MPP, I'm intrigued when I hear them talk about the um, program for import substitution that was launched with the seven-year development program by Okroma, which was one of the main reasons why they overthrew Nkrumah. Nkrumah's project was about political independence as a foundation for economic independence. And he saw that as a path to it. But they will not have it. Their foreign masters will not have it. Because that was an existential threat. We must be and be maintained as a new colony, as he said. We have a president, yes, no problem. You have a parliament, no problem. But we decide what happens in this space. And that's, that struggle doesn't just involve Ghana. That is a struggle mm -hmm. of our lives. The point is that very few people recognize that there's a contingent of Ghanaians whose interests lie not with Ghana, but with foreign powers. Because they simply act as agents in our economy. So you have this, uh, I discovered this concept of uh, the losing bonus. <laughs> yes. Is it only? It was a big issue. Is that so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. I have lost a lot of things. I've not been very active in the football space. But I, I just recently discovered the concept of the losing bonus. So there are people on our side. Ghan, they look Ghanaian. They talk and they work Ghanaian. But their interests lie with foreign powers. And until we begin to recognize them and to tackle them, and to make the routine betrayals of our interests something that is costly. I'm not advertising shooting squad, but it must be costly to persons who betray our interests, who put us in manifestly, obviously disadvantageous uh, positions, in negotiations and in agreements. And you ask yourself, what is it that could have led an intelligent being to agree to set terms? But it's only because all of us lose, but a few people gain. And until we recognize this as a core issue internally, we're not going anywhere fast. So in the middle of all these games, huh? call the elections games in that sense. We may not change much. Because, I mean, from where I'm sitting right now, all I can see is a, a lot of pain and suffering. Austerity. Okay? And what is happening now is that those in power now and the IMF and the American sponsors are arranging so that the pain can be pushed as far down the road as they can. If these criminals in power win the elections, well, sorry, don't blame us, but they are home and dry. But if it's the NDC, they are going to face a torrent of pressure and pain. With this criminal standing on the side and pissing in, he 
you are not going to have any peace. But all I see, at least from my friends in the NDC, is that people think that this is a cakewalk. No. You say it is not so. You don't think so. Well, that's what I see. Right. I like to be convinced that it is not so. There are many people who are proceeding on the basis that, oh, the victory has already been delivered. It's only a matter of taking power. Sorry, folks. <laughs> it's not going to be like that at all. Meanwhile, these criminals are managing the news. Huh? The, the gang, what do you call them? Someone use the term in the media. Who are part of the con in selling Nanado are still part of the plot trying to tell Ghanaians that look, oh we've passed the corner. Which corner? The numbers are looking good because why? You are not servicing your debt. Mm? And people have been very, very patient because they believe that the current regime is quote unquote more reliable for their interests in the sub region and globally. And I mean, the sub region, that is West African sub region, and in the continent. So they need this regime preferably in place. So they'll give them all the concessions they need. Hopefully, they can do the transition. But if they don't, the next government that comes, which is not them, is going to face a lot of pain. Not just the government, but Ghanaians. And I say that there's enough in store for at least one generation, not one presidential term not two presidential terms, one generation. I'm talking about three decades at least. I'm sure by that time I'll be, I'll be long gone, but there's going to be real pain in store. All the signs are there. So in a certain sense, this thing that's going on in the MPP is a side show. But coming back to the, the MPP issue, I don't know how much time I have. Mm. The, you have this interesting thing. I say that, first of all, Dr. Bamia has never been in charge of the economy, was not in charge of the economy. It was, an, it was a con, an elaborate deception. Yet, they must carry on with the deception and allow him to say that he'll be his own man. Even when all the pointers, all the indicators, now, Tell us that no, he's not in control of anything, not even his campaign. But they hope that they can manage the news. They can control the news. They can control the narratives. So that they can finally break the eight, as they call it. Well, as I see it, it is for the it is for the NDC to to lose if they if they wish because of what I have just referred to. Okay, although I am not particularly hopeful of a great transformation because the talk has not come to that yet. Even now, we're talking about a new mobilization. We must win back our independence a second time and have a full-blooded program of national independence, economic independence. I don't see that. I don't hear that. And the people must come to understand that there will be a lot of things because we have really set in store 
a lot of things for ourselves by tolerating the, the bunch that is carrying in power. We ourselves have brought it on us. I mean, collectively, we have brought it on ourselves. As someone said, elections have consequences, right? So I see a lot of pain in the, in the horizon. It doesn't really, I mean, for the, the, the bunch, it doesn't really matter to me who they put together with uh, Dr. Baumia. Okay. Um, let's, let's, let's hope that they put together an Ashanti. Actually, I don't, see, I don't see how they can avoid a major crisis in their party by putting together somebody else. Of, of the Ashanti candidates, I don't see anybody who really stands up to measure. Did you mention Kojo Poku? Yes. Who is he? Uh, he, he actually did contest in the in their primaries, oh, presidential him. primaries. Yes, that that. Okay, Kujopoku. okay, okay. Yes, yes. And yes, where you see? Yes. Well, no problem. Yes. So maybe they should, they should bring him. He maybe has no skeletons. But of the bunch here, <coughs> of the bunch here. All them have serious <coughs> problems. The latest is the this uh, this silly display by the. Did you say it was a front leader or front runner? Yeah. Doctor Poko Prempe. Yeah. Well, I can tell him that I've also drawn up my time t my timetable, except that I didn't come here with my <laughs> my doom my doom saw t shirt. He said it's called doom doom C C right? Doom C C. Thank you my brother. I think it's enough for now. Doc, thank you. Thank you very much. If you just join us, the Mother World Talk shows Halaji and Halaji. We just finished with a discussion on the, um, Dr. Baumia window shopping for a running mate. We have to move on to another discussion that perhaps started somewhere um, many weeks back, actually. But last week, we were, dis we were discussing the same thing. Now, this week, we are back to another discussion on this issue because you know the bill is a bill that has been passed in fact we move beyond even whether the bill had issues or do not have issues it has been passed by members of parliament the problem now is whether the president will sign it first time there were two cases that the president referred to to tell parliament do not bring the bill and that was a discussion we had and the speaker's response by deciding to not to deal with the other government business available and adjourn parliament indefinitely this week the discussion has been on the ndc's accusation of uh, the judiciary is what they saw as selective uh, decisions on when one case should be heard over the other because the richard sky uh, uh, injunction application had come before um rocks and nelson that the honorable actually filed his but his was heard this week the richard sky application was not held, held this week they have different implications if there is just car applications head, whatever decision is made will have an impact on what the president has written. The Honorable Rocks and Nelson, the Department of the implication is on the speaker. So it feels like there was selectivity. But the Attorney General says he wrote a letter to the uh, Chief Justice saying that uh, here the Rocks and Nelson, the Department of case now, and the Chief Justice agreed with him. And the Chief Justice, therefore, panel put together a panel to hear that application and what that application of course was dismissed so we'll be discussing that now and uh, lawyer let me start with you again i'm sure you've been monitoring that uh, you have 10 minutes <laughs> uh, did you say uh, did I turn to, I turn to write to the cj yes he said he wrote to the cj and the content of the letter was that he, the cj should yeah. So, so abridgment yeah. so of time. So it wasn't necessarily a letter asking the, uh, the CJ to do one before the other. No, no, no. Yeah, because we know we can, yeah. you can, you can, we, we can ask for abridgment of time. You know, it's a process that you can do as in four yeah. thousand. No, it was time. not an application. It was a letter to the CJ to use yeah. uh, administrative powers to abridge, yeah. abridge, yeah. abridge time. time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, so we are here once again uh, having to discuss issues mm -hmm. that borders on. Uh, leadership and also the governance structure we 
we chose for ourselves once again. Mm -hmm. I call you, you called me uh, concerning the president's uh, should I say attempt to mm -hmm. me, me, I want to go local to run away from mm -hmm. <laughs> his duty to uh, to uh, to ascend. No, see, if you ask me, if you ask, the president once again has driven the whole country into a very unnecessary on pass. It's, it's, it's very, very honestly because I, I'm so fortified in my belief that the the firm post application, the speaker's uh, position seem is essentially in protest. That's how I see it. Yeah. It's, it's essentially in protest. And uh, to be consistent with my position, uh, I applauded the CJ, I applauded the position he took because I felt that it was an attack on our democracy for the president to disrespect par parliament the way he did when he wrote that unf that unfortunate uh, letter attempting to direct parliament on how they they acted because you see there's a basis for all this and the and the and the, uh, and, the and, and the basis is uh, the bill that was passed as in the bill that essentially is saying uh, order seeks to protect our values, mm. you understand, and and also then also brings to the fore the process that that must go th as in that must be undertaken before a, a, a law becomes a law mm. in this country. Uh, also, you know, we took like I said, we took upon ourselves a constitutional form of democracy. That's in the democracy whose focus is or constitution whose focus is to limit the powers of executive because we thought that that was the best way in which our liberties uh, could be could be could be protected and so in in our constitution there are substantive li limitations on the powers of government there are also procedural uh, lim uh, limitations the the three arms of government or, lim or, or, or to put it in in another form uh, our constitution uh, recognize that really government has three powers. It has executive powers, it has the powers to make laws, and it has the judiciary powers. And this wisdom for that if these powers are put in different entities then and and and, 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 and each other uh, and, and then cause a system where the the various arms of government says as a, a check on the other, then the purpose for which our constitution was adopted as necessary to protect our liberties, our lives, our properties can better be served. And so we always talk about the legislative arm of government serving as a check on this on the executive. But in in the legislative arms or in Parliament's core duty, which is to enact laws, our constitution is wisdom also puts some form of lim limitation on them. And so the constitution says that before a law will become law, it must have been passed, the president must have assented, and it must be same as be published in the Gazette. If the, these processes are not met, then it can't be law. So really the president was put there, or the president was was added to the lawmaking process, essentially to serve as a check on on the on the on on parliament. But even in how the president acts or even uses those those powers, the powers of assent, as a check on parliament, the president himself is powers to do same are limited, are limited by the constitution itself. Because they also recognize that if you do not limit how the president ought to behave, then he could also, as it were, uh, use those powers arbitrarily to advance his his own interest. It is very disappointing that the president will run away from these powers he has for our benefit. And by so doing, create this confusion in, in, in a system. Because if, as in some time past, as in uh, in the dark periods of our of our country, it could have been a cause of war because some bad soldier man can use this confusion and take over power. In fact, our president has been very irresponsible. In that regard, on, on two issues, you, you, uh, you remember the issue, the uh, situation on the 7th of January uh, 2021, when military men were asked to enter into parliament to arrest yes, yes, yes. So what would have happened if, let's say, some wire in the military, as in the commander's head, triggered, and he sees parliament and they said they are taking over the reins of power? 
can you imagine the, yeah, can you, yeah, you, you, you understand? And then to think that such a simple, because you see, you take the bill, and the, you see the reason why some people have, have raised issues with the bill, myself included, has been the section of the bill that seeks to uh, bar or criminalize people's rights to speak their mind. As in, we, 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 we may agree or disagree, but in the bill, if it says that you are barred from speaking your mind or having any view that seeks to support LGBT, the rights of any, of any person to practice LGBT, Plus, 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 you understand? And, and these are legitimate issues that certain people have raised. Now, if you, the president, the bill has come to you, and you think that they are, these are, you have issues with, with them, the constitution says that after the bill has come to you, you have a right to refuse to assent and give your reasons why the bill, why you, you, you won't assent to the bill. Because this shenanigans happening, you will go around and around. Essentially, the president will have no choice. You have to assent to the bill. You yeah, as <laughs> we can we can bet on that. Yeah, yeah, son. But for the president to write the letter that seeks to direct parliament, it was really the transmission of the bill to the president is really a step that is within the powers of parliament itself. So for you, the president, to write that letter that impugns on the independence, autonomy of parliament, really is a disrespect on the tendency and spirit of our constitution itself. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is that act of the president that has caused all this uh, parliament and then also then has drawn in the judiciary. You, you, you understand? Because, that, you know, I ask you that, that we know the abridgment of time is, uh, mm -hmm. is a process that is available to, mm -hmm. to lawyers in cases that you can buy an application Ask that time is abridged on the matter, so it is said quickly. Now we know that Attorney General is, is the party in both of the cases, yeah. not so because he is the legal advisor to Parliament, the legal advisor also to the executive. Mm. You, you, you understand? And so people and the way government governors have been handled in this and those regime, people don't even believe in the integrity of purpose of the president. People do not believe that the president does act in the best interest of the country. People do not believe that the president does act in the interest of the protection of the constitution of this country. Because you see, ordinarily, people shouldn't have doubts as to the reason why the Attorney General is even asking for an appraisement of time in respect of the, 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 the book case. Because there could be legitimate reasons why he thinks that that, that matter should be head first. But the problem they are facing is because of the death of integrity of leadership that has been granted us, Ghanaians don't even believe in the integrity of reason be advanced by the Attorney General. You, uh, and, and, and that's the problem they and ultimately all of us are facing. Because for this our system to work, Ghanaians need to believe in the ability of this governance structure to serve their interest. Mm -hmm. No, as you know, at the beginning I said, the reason why I deliberately said republic is a republic. The re there means more or less like a sovereignty, and the public is all of us. It's a republic. And the purpose of the, the as in the, the, the bit of the constitution says that we, the people of Ghana, have it taken up upon us. Because the purpose for which even the constitution was drafted in the first place was for the purpose, was to serve the purpose of Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. We will keep on saying that people have their own parochial interests and things. But everybody in Ghana has an interest when we are going to vote, when we are. And that interest is what my senior here said that all of us have an interest to see Ghana do well. Because if we have a country that is working with the right governance structure, the right economic environment, when we have all of that, then I have confidence that, listen, the talent that God gave me yes, can serve me better because I can make economic gains out of uh, 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 those 
talents. But unfortunately, because of the lack of leadership or no leadership that we've experienced over the past seven years, people are beginning to lose confidence in even our institutions of state. Mm. Institutions that are meant to protect us. Because for those institutions to work and achieve the goals for which we set them up in the first place, the people need to believe in them. Okay. You see, the people need to, uh, as in, choose in the words of some jurisprudential arguments, they, they, they know the heart uh, fuller debate was on people's fidelity to the law, people's faithfulness to, to the law. Mm. So people's faithfulness to this governance structure has been attacked by the lack of leadership that has been offered by our present government. And uh, 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 Dr. Pesia is a history. I wonder what, how history will deal with him. Mm. Because you see, when, when history is dealing with uh, Ed Anadu, history says not have to say that he was a president that really attacked every single fiber sinew of our country structure mm. and caused the people of this country to start questioning for the first time, whether we even made a mistake in 1992, or to think about ways in which we can safeguard, for, you know, there must be other ways in which we can safeguard this calamity from 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 from, from ever happening again. Because everything is being attacked. Okay. Uh, uh, it was God. You take a vow to protect the values of our country, to protect the the constitution of our country, to 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 protect the values of our country, the, the principles of our country. And you go for a funeral, and then people use the funeral to wish you and sing up your behavior. And you're dead grinning from year to year. You understand? So, uh, for me, I'll just end by saying that ordinarily, ordinarily, if people believed in the integrity of purpose of those in leadership, then this issue wouldn't even have been up for discussion. Because there could be a genuine reason why the Attorney General. Uh, wrote a letter, even if that if the letter is the proper way of doing it, because so far as I'm concerned, you do so by way of motion, I stand to be corrected. Yeah. But so far as I'm concerned, you do it by you do same by way of motion because we know that in a system, it's not just about the substance, but the procedure is also very, very critical. Maybe okay. I don't know, I've not been at Tonja before, I don't know. Maybe at Tonja, maybe mm -hmm. you said you can educate me further, but even the process in which he did this and. The way the president has the whole has been handled, the fact that the Ministry of Finance can write a letter to the president advising him not to okay. assent, yes, and the fact that you are telling and, and that letter, if I let, me, let me say, it was very unfortunate because it was an admission of we having gotten ourselves into this new colonialism. Kwame Nkrumah uh, uh, was uh, was uh, was talking about, okay. and 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 you yeah, understand yeah, so. I see you are you are in hurry. Yeah, so to time. end, so that my other colleagues will just say, I'll just say that there's something that we need to learn from all what has happened. That you, when you put yourself up to be a leader, when you are given the opportunity, the privilege to lead, you must you must understand that what has been put into your hands is not just uh, even beyond the bread and butter, but even to create a system where the republic, the people will believe that you are there to save their interests. When you do the same, then such certain fundamental issues like this issue wouldn't even come up for us to discuss. Before I come to Ambassador, this is Azuma Besaro says, uh, okay, tell Dr. Uh, tell Comrade Dr. Percy that he will not leave us now. We need him to wage a total revolution to save our mother Ghana. Uh, can the NDC take note of the so many uh, splinter groups in the party and without the bad ones who are only there for the opposite of the party. Uh, thank you. Franz Gordon says, first, congratulations to the people of Senegal for fighting through the storms defying all oppression to elect a new leader. Bravo to all Senegalese. The situation is not going to be any different in Ghana come December 7, uh, 2024 elections. Whatever the government does to intimidate voters, journalists, Ghanaians in general, who will not we will still make sure breaking the eight will not happen. Mismanagement, corruption, lies, no respect to the people of Ghana, insecurity and doom so will be no more. Ghana will reject the MPP just like it happened in Senegal. Barbara Fai says, my advice to Dr. Bomia is to be mindful the way he talks to NDC because after the 2024 election, the MPP will take their party from Dr. Bomia. So we'll come back to the NDC. That's Barbara Fai. Uh, Lydia Kam says, pro Nana Opokwajima has the knowledge and wisdom to assist Mahama to rescue and save our beloved country from the NPP. Uh, Marsh Taylor says a good morning to especially Dr. David. He made me understand that I did the right thing, not belonging to the UP tradition. 
Thanks to Dr. Kwame Nkuma in the Rollings for the recognition of nothingness as part of Mother Ghana. Thank you. Uh, there's Dela Abdullah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Baba Musa says, Dr. Baba Musa says, thank you to your team. Uh, I think that whoever Dr. Baumia chooses to, does not matter. It will be an unpardonable mistake for Guardians to go to the polls in December and queue to vote for Baumia and the MPP again after they have planned this country into a bottomless pit. I strongly disagree with my senior Dr. Percy that Dr. Baumia was not part of those who mismanaged the economy. Such assertions will amount to unjustifiably exonerating the incompetent driver mate. Um, what he said was that he was not in control. There was a, yes, he was not in control. Being a con. Yes. part of the con, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, well, so those are some of the messages you're sending to us via Facebook. Um, Ambassador. Well, before I go on, John Dramani Mahama has said that he is an Assemblies of God person, isn't it? Mm. And a Christian. And therefore does not support LGBTQ. Dr. Baumia, you're also a flag bearer of the MPP, not so. Alan is also a flag bearer. By Friday next week, they should all declare their stand. Alan, 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 Alan has declared. He says, yes. he says he was present, he was presented to the Belong Look, that's good. Yeah. Dr. Baumia, we give you up to Friday. State your, your belief. And as usual, I cannot trust him. Uh, Baumia, Timothy. Because one time it's a boy scout, another time it's a boy's brigade, another time it's a Muslim, another time it's a Christian. But both Christians and Muslims have come together to put this LGBTQ. He's a Christian. Christian. <laughs> so, Bagumia, we we'll give you up to Friday. Declare your stand on this LGBTQ. See, I very much agree with Dr. Pierre Dankwa saying that. Mr. Pierre Dankwa, mm -hmm. is the is the kind of person we have as a president that have pushed all of us into this crisis. Today, non-lawyers and lawyers are deeply involved in argument as to whether the AG had the right to do that or that not to do that. He and I know as lawyers that if you have a case. And I want the time to be brought forward. I apply by motion for abridgment of time. And either the mo motion is by ex party or by motion, whatever it is, the other lawyer has to be made aware that, oh, for such and such a reason. I mean, when you apply for the abridgment of time, you just don't apply. You give reasons in an affidavit to support why the abridgment of time should occur. So the other lawyer will also be informed and adjust his time uh, times yeah, here yeah, timetable. You know, Senator, there's nothing frustrating as a lawyer to drive all the way to, maybe to Tamale or Takrade or Kofodia. You sit there, you reach there because if you have traveled, Bam is you, you get to the court before eight. You sit there up to eleven. Eh, for a judge to tell you, oh, cancel, sorry. The other uh, lawyer has written that he's not able to come. And this is a practice we all of us do not like. Okay. So, whether or not the AG had the right to write, because he's an attorney general, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to go into that. But the register of the court, having accepted the abridgment of time, have to notify the other lawyer. Mm. If he didn't do that, what will happen is what happened with the firm of post uh, lawyers because they were not informed about the, the date the case was coming on. All they knew was that they have written, they have not been given a, hear, a date for hearing. Be it as it may. We are, where, we are where we are because of the character of a president that we have. What is happening in court is just the procedure. The substantive issue why we are all scattered is the fact that Parliament has decided that they will not allow the executive 
to minimize their role in the uh, which is enshrined in the constitution you understand i was a member of the consultative assembly when we came to this uh, laws formation of laws it was tag of war for us to even accept customary law as part of our practice but but thank god there were very powerful chiefs there who insisted Otio Shiba was there Nana Bonsen was there a lot of Nana Bonsen going they were all there who said that customary law if you do away with customary law then we lose our identity as Ghanaians Sana name one ethnic group in this country whose customs allow LGBT one one from the time of our uh, existence as Ghanaians name one family that has uh, contracted a marriage between two males where Adakuru or where or Takradi or where name it Ochebi no but if you say that you have made a mistake and of the information we are picking is that LGBT is not strange to Nana Kufado it's not it's not alien to Nana Kufado at all you remember he, he said he stayed in UK where his uncle J.B. Dankwa's first son Dr. Paul Dankwa is a known LGBT so LGBT is not alien to uh, Nana Kufado and even taking the case from him the rules are very clear in the constitution under article 106 how to transmit this matters in the passage of law we agreed that if a president should have majority in parliament he can bring any obnoxious law and it will be passed all right or parliament on its own can be used or can use itself to pass obnoxious law so for the purpose of checks and balances parliament pass, passes the bill it has to get the an assent of the president and be gazetted before it becomes a law that is all we know so when parliament finishes a bill the route is that transmit it to the president when you send it to the president he has time limit for which he has to respond that okay i've received this bill but please can you amend this 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 and that? first he has to accept that whether he accept the bill or not if he doesn't accept he has to explain to parliament by writing why he does not accept the bill and if parliament is minded will factor the concerns of the president in a making making amendments the other route is very simple which i thought common sense would have uh, advised the president that look just refer this matter to the council of elders council of state, state yeah. finish <laughs> if the president was was minded of i mean advised properly he ought to have just taken it there and all this will have value we are facing would not have happened so now do you know the cost of reassembling parliament do you know the cost of empaneling i mean the supreme court Wait. now i am not interested in discussing the legal tussle the legal tussle of whether the firm of force was first or not i'm not interested in that but the legal principle is trite that in litigation you don't surprise your other party and attorney general in this case is a lawyer like me and you sitting, sitting before judges yes attorney general in this matter is an ordinary lawyer for president uh, for the state isn't it so if you are acting in as a lawyer practice to take that whatever step you take you inform the other parties some people have argued that it is only when you um applying by motion that the other party must be informed i don't agree the letter you wrote courtesy even courtesy demands that your other lawyer has to be informed <coughs> or just he thought because he's an attorney general he can do things and the court will accept and that's what has happened but I'm not interested in going that. We give him the benefit of the doubt. So the speaker also said, oh yeah. 
if you have gone that route, I also go through that route. Sayo on the Sayo. You see, thank God we have somebody like uh, Bagbin as the Speaker of Parliament. Who knows what he's about? This is not a time where MPP had a majority. And so most of the obnoxious law that were passed, including tax exemptions, were passed during Speaker of Queen's time. Right? Akufa does still want to get Parliament to give more, more tax exemptions. Sana, two bills are here. One, appointment of ministers for more do, for more cash, for more expenditure. Mm. And LGBTQ. Which of the two bills have Ghanaians spoken about? Or Ghanaians not that, that Ghanaians don't like? The LGBTQ, I'm told that all the members of parliament, to the extent that we have not seen anyone who have uh, 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 said that I'm not part of it, these members of parliament represent the people of Ghana, not so. Mm. All of them have said, no, we don't like it. We don't like the uh, LGBTQ. Like me and like uh, other council, mm. there are other parts of the bill that can be um, looked at. Yes. All right? But collectively, we have accepted it. Okay. With all his mistakes. Because no law is perfect. Mm. All right? That is why when a law is passed, it can even go to the Supreme Court for Supreme Court say no, this and this and that. We rule that is not right. And it to be accepted. There have been so many laws, including the obnoxious uh, Joe Wise, uh, uh, Joe Wise going to court to say that I, as a speaker, I can also vote. But we accepted it. No, so. So, what is haunting the president? President, what is haunting you from running away from the bill? Okay. And my friend Asante Bedutio, please take note that power is transient. I've been a civil servant all my life. When your boss calls you to draft a letter, first, the, pre the, the boss is writing with all his emotions. Maybe something has happened and that's is emotionally affected. You take the notes, you do a first draft, discuss it even with your colleagues you see then the colleagues is oh this part this word you have used if you use this word it will be better mm. but for a sentiment to just write a letter that parliament should desist and cease with a legal uh, uh, words desist means never try it if you try it this will be the consequence and cease stop who told you that you have a right to tell parliament, instruct parliament not to do his work? Hmm. And you write to the president, the uh, uh, speaker of parliament, without respect, without any respect. Bagbin is more senior to Asandi Bediyo in law. Not so. And the law, uh, as lawyers, we don't treat seniors like that. So now let me back, uh, come down. Because Today, you have to wrap up for me. Yeah, I'm wrapping up. Yeah. Today, we have all been discussing, including Pan-African Television, using uh, your station, mm -hmm. man hours, to discuss this stupidity. Stupidity. Because the speaker, uh, the uh, finance people have warned the president not to sign. Look, every money we take from the IMF is a loan we are going to pay. No, so... And which conditions in the IMF loan that uh, IMF deal we signed included, included the fact that if we, we sign LGBT, they don't give us the money? Which, which clause had that? None. It's a contract we are signed with IMF. Do this, do this, and I'll give you this money. And LGBT is not, LGBT is not part of it. In any case, LGBT has been ruled by the international court. That is not a human rights issue. Look. So, me and Apia Dankwa, we, are, we have our wives. You have your wife, you have your wife. If you want to uh, have sex with our wives, 
should you advertise it? Should you form associations before association before before we, we we have sex with our wives? This issue, if you don't take care, it will destroy our country. Okay. It will destroy our country, and that is why the chiefs, the uh, clergy, and everybody is against that. Okay, I'm So I am ending. I am ending on one request. Dr. Baumia, by Friday, declare your stand on the LGBT. Otherwise, we'll add you to the group of people who are promoting the LGBT bill. And take the LGBT bill. Thank you. Doc. Um, we're in a very interesting situation. Um, I'm the old man out. Because uh, we are dealing with two lawyers, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, first has to do with the Supreme Court. Yeah. Okay. Um, as a layman, I have, uh, I'm in a, in a situation, in a very difficult situation. But my attitude to this Supreme Court is that it has established that it has a right to be arbitrary and what's the other word? Is it whimsical? Mm. Yes. Capricious. Capricious. That's yes, capricious. Thank you very much. <laughs> now my 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 friends are officers of the court, so they, they cannot speak the way I'm speaking. But one of the falsehoods on which this whole principle of the judiciary is built is that uh, justice is blind, right? But at all times, the law reflects politics. So for instance, in a period of slavery, the slave owner own human beings as property. He could put in some in many in many places. He could put that property to death and suffer no consequence. Right? Today, under the law. There are people who are entering factories to work. This other day, there are people who are entering factories to work. They are going to work cooperatively to generate surpluses by law. It is the right of the owner of capital to take all the surplus. This is lawful, legalized theft for the owner of capital to take all the surplus. The simple, the simple name for that system is capitalism. That is the law. So at all times, Law is a consequence of politics and the political system. So there's this elaborate this thing to pretend that it is not. That's the first falsehood we have to address. And in Ghana, the law, at least, running from the time of just before independence, throughout, 
the law has been a loyal constituency of the NPP. They are the law. The bar, the bench, there are different sections of the NPP at work. The bar association, these days we even forget about them. Once upon a time they were very, very loud. There was even a time when they went on, do I call it legal vacation? No, they went on vacation. They said, oh, with a... No, 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 no strike. They said with the election of the MPP, it was no longer necessary for them to engage in the public space, in activism. Yes. So the MPP will fight very fiercely to retain control of that space. I think you've forgotten the words of the the late former general secretary when the issue of the that uh, fraudulent case was sent to the Supreme Court, the petition was it nineteen for twenty twenty thirteen? Yes. When he had only one prob a problem with only one person on the bench. They were sure of the pedigree of everybody. They knew where they stood. They had a problem with only one person. Atuguba. He they were not sure about. And then it hasn't really mattered who has appointed whom. Because the pool from which they are selected is narrowed. So no matter what happens, they will be remain in charge of the law. Now, are we convinced, in spite of my own argument, that it is possible for the, 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 the judiciary to be, quote unquote, fair and sensible? I mean, someone said that the law must always make sense. When they finally come to this ridiculous decision they made about the, what is it, the birth certificate. Mm -hmm. I think that's still, that thing is still hanging, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, what is, what is the evidence that you're a Ghanaian? You have a Ghana card. <laughs> we cannot be issued when you are when you are born because your features are not fully formed. I hear. And you have this standing foolishness. And we are all living with it. And we're happy to proceed like nothing is happening. So well, for me as a a lay person, they provide some relief on the fringes, but comic relief on the fringes, but that's all. But the real issue is that law everywhere reflects politics and power. And that is the situation in Ghana, no less. We should, kid, we should, we should quit kidding ourselves. The NDC should know that there's a permanent majority for the MPP in the bench at the bar. Finito. If they recognize that and they recognize the class basis of this I'm talking about, then they, are, they, then they really can, can get into the fight. Otherwise, they are wasting their time. Just a shy side show. Now, coming about coming back to the our president. I mean there, he said a number of things that I cannot disagree with. Right? He said that 
he does not intend to sign to make uh, this LGBT thing legal as president. He does not think Ghanaians are sufficiently seized with this thing to advocate for it. Mm -hmm. And he says that if there's enough social pressure brought an agreement, things can change. And he refers to his time in the UK. Okay. Okay. It's one of the few occasions I can agree with him. But our president has always run away from responsibility. This president has always run away from responsibility. Now, those, those words that were conveyed by his assigned, the secretary, to parliament, where his very words, they are an expression of an autocrat, of a despot, sees desist. I am the law. And at all material times, that is what our president has displayed. But it's in a very difficult situation because you know what? In opposition, they use this LGBT baiting, okay, to really go at President Mahama, okay? talking about his associations with some gay publisher, blah, 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 blah. It was a big deal. Yeah. It was at the heart of it. OK. Now, he's also put in a very difficult situation where he must walk the talk. Ghana beyond aid. Here we are on all fours going from one creditor to another, asking for compassion, space, because we have really put ourselves in a mess. And he cannot ignore the words of the resident governor. You know the resident governor. Oh, the American ambassador. You don't know that? Yes. So, and they are on a roll. I mean, that is the, the, the trend. Otherwise, for me, why should what adults do in private be our business? up to the point of putting people in jail. What should be your business? Of all the issues that we have, material and existential, must we spend so much time on this? But I see that it's become a huge frenzy I'm patient enough to wait to see how this frenzy develops. Our president has put himself because he's trying to ride two horses simultaneously. Not even two horses go in the same direction, but two horses <laughs> going <laughs> in opposite directions. How, how you manage to achieve that is the problem. Because otherwise, if you have no problem with signing this thing with a flourish, with this grandstanding, but no. The real truth is that yes, the Ghanaian economy, given the mess, is in a really bad situation. What is this? Sorry. I thought I'd put it off. The real truth is that the Ghanaian economy is in a really, really bad situation.
we are on all fours pleading with our creditors. And there's very little room for this thing. And if they are going to have any chance of spinning the story of Ghana having turned the corner and taking us to the election, okay, if they can successfully do that, they believe that they will be home dry. Except I don't see how that can happen with the third issue that we never got around to talking about. Doom so, or is it doom CSA? Doc, thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'm sure there'll be time to talk about it. In fact, mm. there's a conversation, ongoing conversation that, of course, we have, would have. Uh, but Doc says, you have your timetable ready. I have my time, personal timetable. <laughs> You've wow. drawn your timetable. <laughs> we should all draw it. <laughs> you can pass it on. <laughs> well, about some of the offenses, it's good enough when Educhum are the same. Now, Educhum has collapsed Ghana's education system. No textbooks, no proper timetable for both basic and secondary education. To who, whoever the super incompetent vice president Baumia will bring will not change anything. MPP is already in opposition. We can allow Baumia to scam Ghanaians for the third time. Uh, thank you. There's a uh, okay, Nana Nana PC or say there are thirteen states out of fifty one states in the America where there are laws ban LGBTQ plus practice. There's the US ambassador must leave Ghana in shame. Uh, thank you very much for that message. Let me say a happy birthday to Wilson Lavon. Wilson Lavon works with me at Radio Gold. He works in the marketing department. A happy, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And of course, happy birthday to my girlfriend, Fred Obo, who also celebrates his birthday today. Yesterday was the birthday of uh, <laughs> President Nanado Dankwe Kufuado. He turned 80 yesterday. Happy 80th birthday uh, to him. He got, uh, people actually sang happy birthday to him at the one week commemoration of, yes, yes, of, of, uh, of the late John Kuma, uh, who died quite young. So, well, but a happy birthday, belated birthday to him. And also a happy birthday to Air Vice Marshal Napoleon Yelvi, Richard Ashley Lassen. Uh, today, today is your birthday, it was born on, uh, yesterday, 1934. 1934, March 29, 1934. Uh, well, thank you very much for making time to join us on the Mother of All talk shows today. Alaji and Alaji. The program. We're live from the Osajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah Studios of Pan African Television. And let me say a big thank you to Dr. David Pesci, who is a student of history and politics. A big thank you to, and it was nice to see Ambassador Sampiale, who is former Ghana High Commissioner to India, and of course, President of NDC Pro Forum. And of course, always a pleasure to see Laya Pia Dangwa, who is a member of the Movement for Change. On behalf of the rest of the team, uh, Director Gerald, and of course, uh, the person in charge of sound, Emmanuel Ose, a big thank you also to the producers, uh, Rabna Frimpong, Tijani Badamasi, and of course, to Latifa Adams. And of course, a big thank you to Sewa. Uh, okay, today I understand sound is actually Raphael. And let me extend greetings to Dion Hubert. Dion Hubert, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon to you. And of course, condolences to Denny Siao Akwete. Uh, well, we are back same time next week to another edition of the show. Happy Easter to every one of you and uh, enjoy the rest of the Easter. We'll see you next week. Thank you. He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the Redeemer. He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land.